Hi everyone, it's 5.58 a.m. March 24th in the supposed year of 2017, and that is Eastern Standard Time, 5.59 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, I'm really glad to be back in front of this microphone, even though uh, I really didn't want to again, and I haven't wanted to. Uh, for just about two weeks now. Uh, last week, I forced myself to do the, I think I did one video to do that. And it's uh, kind of the same thing this week. Now, part of it could be the fact that I've been out of work for the past couple of weeks. And if you're a man with a strong sense of your responsibility, you know, as a man, then you know what it feels like. Uh, and I chose a while ago to work for myself independently. And that carries with it a lot of risks. So those times happen, uh, fortunately. And I'd like to thank the Father, um, in the Son for giving me work. So, I'm going to be going back to work today. Um, you'll notice a lot of times that, like what I just said, you know, I thank the Father, and then I paused, and I, in the Son. The reason for that is because, you know, I'm not so much different than most of you that would be listening to this. I think there's a lot of things the, about us that are very similar. I'm looking for what is the truth of matters, and most specifically the truth of the word of Yahweh, the truth of the message and the person of Yeshua who we commonly know as Jesus, his only begotten Son, and the Messiah, the King, our High Priest, the Lamb of Revelation, who was slain before the foundation of the world. Because in Yeshua's high priestly prayer in John 17, 3, he says, this is eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. And I just grew up being taught certain things in certain ways. They became habit. They became tradition. And the, the more I study, the more I know, the more I grow, the more I experience life and specifically experience Yahweh, the Father, through His Son, Yeshua, my Messiah, in the light, uh, the light of life, experiencing Him in this way. I find that a lot of things that I picked up by tradition or habit things that I was just told and raised on, they become more and more uncomfortable. So, I, you know, I'm in a very awkward stage with a lot of things, a lot of things I say that I think, that I believe. Uh, I often am uncomfortable with ending, you know, every single prayer. At the end, we've got that old, in Jesus' name, amen thing. But when we look at the way that Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, Yehoshua. I'm good with Yeshua. It's truncated form of Yehoshua. Yah is salvation. We look at the way that he taught us to pray, his disciples. And he didn't say that every time we had to say a prayer, we had to say, and in his name, that there was that caveat. He did say if we ask things in his name, but we need to consider what in the name of means, 
Are we talking specifically about nomenclature? Uh, or are we talking about by way of authority of? Like he said, he came in his father's name. By way of authority. By his authority. Praying to the father by the authority. The authority which the son has with the father. As opposed to tagging that in Jesus' name line at the end that that's what's going to carry the weight as opposed to praying to the Father in the authority that we have been given by the Son. So there's a lot of things I stumble around with because, like so many of you, I'm learning, I'm growing. So you'll forgive me when I do that because we're all being sanctified in different ways um, yeah so today I put up this image on my screen which is uh, it's, it's sort of a a meter that's give, trying to give us a, a representation of the visible spectrum of light and that visible spectrum of light is what causes us to be able to do things like see colors. Um, you'll notice that at, at night, when it's the moon that's shining with its own light, when it shines its light on the land um, and on objects, they reflect a very different light than when the sun shines its light during the day on things. And so I find that since it would seem that a lot, a, a lot of um, bands and rays of, of radiation have been detected that are far broader um, both ways than our visible spectrum of light that that's that's something that I think we should consider it, it's an amazing thing that even somebody like myself who fortunately at 42 still has 2020 vision I can see colors pretty much perfectly um, and that's not common and so I've been given really good eyesight but even somebody like me with such very good eyesight when you think about it even if I perceive the full color spectrum of visible light I'm only seeing a tiny degree of the the rays that are out there both um well what's the best way to say yes um both above and below the the visible light spectrum the reason i find that really interesting it it has a a bit to do with uh, a a comment that uh, Jenny had written on the circumstantial worldviews to be, where I was talking about those two kids who had seen this creature, this sort of flying creature, it was like five foot six foot tall, and it had the the, the these strange looking wings that you know were bunched up by its shoulder and smashed gorilla looking face strange beak red eyes uh they told their parents their parents didn't believe them but the father went out and checked where they said that it was the next day and he found those prints of it in the dirt i think that description that they gave it sounds a lot like the same descriptions of like the mothman in point pleasant and all that but anyways um, <clears throat> the whole point was that these 
kid's parents didn't believe him. <laughs> they didn't believe him. And I went through the same thing when I was a kid. And I, at night, I was so afraid uh, every night to go to bed. To be left alone in my room. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is when I'm in a room, like when I go to sleep in a room or something like that, I like the door closed. And oftentimes I like the door closed and locked because I'm asleep. And so I kind of like, I, I like this sense that, you know, when I'm sleeping, you know, nobody can just walk in a, a door or whatever, you know. I keep the doors on my house locked as well. So it's not really like me to want to want to sleep with you know doors open or anything. Just ne never has been. But when I was a kid, and we're gonna say from about the ages of seven to ten, this is when I was given my own room. Up until the age of seven, I didn't have my own room. I kind of had to rotate between my parents or my two different sisters or my brother's room and a sleeping bag, sleep on their floor. This was uh, post uh, bunk beds that they had set up in uh, uh, my brother and I's room um, because I couldn't stay in the top bunk and I had actually fallen out of the top bunk. That's a bad story right there. But uh, I was given my own room and um, it, uh, this yeah, there's something something wrong going on in this room and I don't you know I don't know why. When I would go to sleep at night, my bed was in the opposite corner of the corner of the room where the door was at that went out into the, the hall. Um, it was a small hall that led to the other bedrooms upstairs in a very old farmhouse. Square farmhouse with a pyramid style roof. Um, very basic. So if you can imagine the layout of the upstairs rooms would have been sort of in a U. Uh, around the stairs that were enclosed uh, by walls going down to the, the landing below. And, and the downstairs was shaped uh, like a U as well with the chimney running up the center of the house. Typical old uh, Civil War era farmhouse. And I believe it was that old. So, yeah, my bed would be in the opposite corner of the room as the, the door... And I, I would not, I would not sleep with that door closed. The reason that when I went to bed at night, that door had to be open and the hall light had to be on. I needed light. Was because although I couldn't see what it was that was bothering me. I knew it was there. And the door had to stay open because I knew it was behind the door. So you, you have a hard time as a child getting somebody to believe that. Especially if you have parents who think they've got a lot of things figured out or who maybe are too tired to want to cope with these continual uh, problems that a child is bringing up of things that sound either too sensational or they're just things that a person's not fit to cope with because they've already they've already developed worldviews and so many people don't want to budge off those worldviews and so they don't listen to their children and things like well with me uh so for a couple couple few years straight uh in that room and then there was yeah, there was basically just years of ptsd after that even uh, when we had moved, you know, into other houses, um, I still couldn't sleep right for many, many years. 
because of being traumatized for only a few years. Traumatized in the way of, as I said, I would have a great fear. I knew something was there. Positive. And I would just be filled with so much dread. So much dread. So much fear. I would lay off and at night watching that door. Terrified that I would suddenly see that door move and then who knows I was so afraid of that area of my room at night that as a little boy if I had to if I went to bed with a full bladder and I had to pee there was a window near my my bed I would I would pee out the window um, if the window was shut because it was winter time and it was cold and and they would um, they would winterize the outside of the windows with plastic during the winter mostly um, and I couldn't muster up the the courage to go near that door just to go out so I could go downstairs to the bathroom and pee um, sometimes I would resort to peeing in things, or a few times I, I peed behind my dresser, which was right near my bed, and all of this because I was terrified in my own bedroom every night. So this is why it's so important for parents to listen to their children, so they can solve, help to to solve these problems. Parents need to think about what things they're allowing in their homes. People, when they look at a home that they're going to move in, either rent or buy, people need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Because if you are, you're typically, I don't know if there's any variations to this, you're typically, you're going to be very sensitive when things are wrong. In the past, I've turned down houses because I've walked through them and knew that something was wrong. The place didn't feel right. And that's all I needed to say, no. That's okay. We'll pass. So parents need to be sensitive to these things. As far as being wise to these things, uh, the details, and um, I don't know how, how necessary that is. I think that we need to... Um, Put our faith in the Father, Yahweh, because of uh, the works and promises of His in Yeshua. I continually, either during family prayers, um, at dinner, or in my own private prayer time, continually ask and invite uh, the Spirit of Yahweh to dwell in my home, to dwell with us. <clears throat> and since it's not a common thing for the Spirit of Yahweh to want to dwell in a place that you are profaning, I think it's wise to consider what ways or what things you you may have or bring into your home or invite that are well they're very incompatible with a place and an environment where the spirit of Yahweh wishes to dwell that's same with our own bodies you see when we allow uh, sin in our bodies 
it's not compatible with the spirit of Yahweh. When we bring sinful things and dark things of the demonic, and it doesn't have to just be it doesn't just have to be things that that Hollywood calls demonic, you know. Um, I think it's a pattern that people with um, habitual pornography issues are inviting the same kind of um, bad spirit to, to dwell in their home as, as people that allow talismans um, and things like that in their home. Um, I would get rid of them. Now, Jenny said that there were things in her home that were related to the occult and that her mother was into uh, the occult perhaps spiritism you know I don't know exactly what my parents were doing at that stage in my life or if they were doing anything at all or if that house was a bad place and they didn't have the discernment to to know that uh, throughout that house, really, even when, after my parents got divorced and my dad pretty much moved everything downstairs to save on energy, because we, we burned wood there, I mean, we were old school, even then, the dread in that house, when I would sleep downstairs, I didn't even have to sleep in that room anymore, the dread in that house came from there. It always came from there, that room. Even when I was downstairs, in my mind's eye, I knew that the dread of the house was focused there. My brother admitted 20 some odd years later, I didn't even bring it up. He did. He said that there was something and he described what he knew it was in his mind's eye exactly what I knew it was. And he said it would stand behind the door, same thing. So it's not uh, a child's imagination. So there are things that we don't understand. They are real things, and some people are far more sensitive to these things than other people are, because everybody everybody's built a little differently. Now everybody has different gifts, and some people are far more intuitive than other people are. And sometimes I think that it's the intuits that oftentimes are so sensitive to, to these things. So even though I'm going to be talking about this subject for a bit on this video, I do feel woefully inadequate to talk about this subject. The best I can do is talk about things that I, I'm aware of from the Bible and see if, by considering those things, maybe we can understand these other things that maybe are hard to understand or that we don't know about. and, and Maybe we, you know, maybe we don't really need to know a lot about them or, or shouldn't know a lot about them, you know, and that's something that people need to consider.
especially the people that kind of obsess on these kind of things, you know? Um, so that's a serious consideration. And you know something before I forget, I gotta, I gotta get this in. Uh, we're doing another hangout this Sabbath at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So an hour uh, earlier than we did did it last week. I've got it on my channel listed under events. 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I think the problem with um, the disconnect between the Hangout and uh, the YouTube uh, chat and everything and how there there wasn't any live feed or or anything like that I think that might have been a general problem that everybody was experiencing because there were other people that did live videos that weekend same kind of thing was happening to them so we're hoping this time it'll get worked out if it doesn't then you know we'll shoot for the week after getting those bugs worked out but as for now I think it might just be a a, a glitch that other people were experiencing too a glitch with Google and YouTube so um yeah please join us uh for this i guess you know strangely enough whether it's strange or not i don't know i'm going to start with with a verse from isaiah 45 7. yahweh speaking through isaiah he says i form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I am Yahweh who does all these things. Okay. Keeping that in mind, we can start with Leviticus 19.31 and we are going to see a huge handful of passages that, that say things very similar to this. But uh, that should just tell us that this subject is extremely important to Yahweh so that he repeated himself a, a great number of times. All right, but in Leviticus 19.31, Yahweh says, Don't turn to those who are mediums, nor to wizards. Don't seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, Aloha, your God. If you have eSword, it's a really great tool. I use it in conjunction with a number of other digital Bible tools, but eSword's good. There's a section in the commentary called TSK Cross References. It's fantastic because any verse you click on, it will give you a whole slew of cross references that uh, they either are repetitive in the content or they will link you to very similar uh, things and content. It's really great for when you're studying Revelation, although there is a disconnect between the New and the Old Testament because of the Hebrew and the Greek, and that drives me nuts. So I can't do straight word searches because of the Hebrew to the Greek, but the TSK cross-reference will allow you to search back into the Tanakh when you're in Revelation. Use it. Great tool. So there's a lot of cross-references here. We've got Leviticus 19.26. You shall not eat any meat with blood still in it. You shall not use enchantments nor practice sorcery. So those people who, who drink blood of any kind, they've got problems. We know they've got problems. Um, if, if any of you have heard of Kuru, you know, you can understand that's just one of the problems. That's a physical manifestation of a far deeper problem because these people are defiled. They're defiled by these things. They're made dirty by these things. Uh, Leviticus 26 and 7, the person that turns to those who are mediums and to the wizards to play the prostitute after them. I will even set my face against that person. I will Cut them off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, separate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am Yahweh, your God. He calls people who go to mediums and who go to wizards 
prostitutes. They're prostituting themselves. When they seek after any spirit that is not Yahweh, their God, they're playing the prostitute. They're defiling themselves. They're making themselves dirty. Now keep that in mind because he continually calls those, calls Israel when Israel goes after their Balim and their Ashtara, uh, when they worship of all things the disgusting God Moloch and cause their children to be burned to death. They have their orgies for these non gods, although they are called Elohim. They are not the only true God. They're defiling themselves. They're making themselves prostitutes. They're playing the harlot. They're whoring themselves. So that's precisely the way he puts communing with any spirit that is not his spirit, the Holy Spirit. He says in Exodus 22, 18, you shall not allow a sorceress to live. Exodus 20, 27, a man or a woman that's a medium or a wizard shall surely be put to death. You'll stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 14, there shall not be found with you anyone who makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire one who uses divination, one who practices sorcery, or an enchanter, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a consulter with a familiar spirit, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For whoever does these things is an abomination to Yahweh. Because of these abominations, Yahweh your God drives them out from before you. You shall be perfect with Yahweh, your God. For these nations that you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery and to diviners. But as for you, Yahweh, your God, has not allowed you to do so. Now, consider this. If we go back to the book of Exodus, And to chapter 11, the final plague threatened. This is the Passover. Now, when speaking of the Passover, that is to come. <clears throat> I have the exact verse written down here. But then again, I got a lot of verses written down in here. <laughs> uh... Okay, so we've got Exodus 11. Um, okay, here we go. Mm. All right. This is where he says, uh, at midnight, I will go out in the middle of Egypt. Um... Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. It's probably 10. No, I'm looking at my notes. Where's Exodus? Exodus 11. Sorry. It's 12, 12. I apologize for that break. Exodus 12, 12. Yahweh says, For I will go through the land of Egypt in that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and animal. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. So that's, I think that should be a point of interest. 
that these plagues, they did, of course, directly affect the people of Egypt and then did not affect uh, Israel. But Yahweh says here in Exodus 12, 12, he says, against all the gods of Egypt, the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. We know that there exists a realm that we're not very aware of. But Yahweh, and then in the New Testament, Yeshua's apostles and Yeshua himself, they tell us quite enough concerning what we need to know about these things. Incidentally, depending on the translation you have, quite often when Yeshua is dealing with people who are demonically possessed or oppressed, it's called an unclean spirit. See, having, having anything to do with these spirits makes one unclean. They're unclean. Uh, so, in the uh, part of uh, Ephesians 6 concerning the armor of God, I'm sure a lot of people have heard it. I'm going to repeat it again when he's saying to put on the whole armor of God. And this is why it's important to put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world's rulers of the darkness of this age, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, and he goes on to describe the different points of the armor and what they mean and why you need to put this armor on. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Yeshua, the Messiah, it did not say that he defeated Herod, the Pharisees, the Roman Caesar. He defeated Satan and his principalities and his powers of darkness on the cross because of what he did he made a mock he he made an open display of them and utterly defeated them in fact satan since Yeshua ascended up to the throne of God and inherited the authority of all things on heaven and on earth, becoming the Lord of the living and the dead, been given his scepter of rulership and righteousness, Satan is no longer able to come before the throne of Yahweh and accuse the brethren. So there is a very real spiritual war that's going on. And those people who would commune with or in any way glorify or, or their minds would continually wonder after those things. They're playing the prostitute. And they're dirtying themselves and defiling themselves with these things and by these things. Now back to the reason that I had this spectrum on the screen of what uh, bit of light is visible and, and what is not. Because there's a real popular guy who is a former soccer goalie 
that talks extensively about these beings who, as he said, they they operate outside the spectrum of visible light. And I know you, you all know who I'm talking about, but um, he's not alone in these beliefs. Now, whether he is a purposeful, conscious agent in the temporal way, or whether he's lost and blind, and this is the best bit of truth that he's managed to dig out and then is putting it together all in the wrong ways or not, I I don't know. I really don't. <clears throat> but, you know, with about all of these people, and I mean just about all of them, there always exists a certain facet of what they say that has a pretty high degree of truth or facts at least underlying it. If it didn't, <clears throat> they would be found out to be the con men and charlatans that many other people are. So they've got to have this certain amount of truth to what they're talking about, or a certain amount of facts underlying their theories. Now this guy's theories go sort of like this, that there are these beings, reptilian beings, that dwell outside of the visible spectrum of light. And he's specific about reptilians. Now, he goes further on to say that he believes that reptilians have been in some way breeding with humans for some time now. And this is where a lot of different worldviews concerning these things sort of clash and meld and are a little bit divergent. You've got Jim Mars uh, sort of worldview about um, the Anunnaki. Then you've got some uh, who talk about, you know, the Archons. Those who believe that Earth is a spinning ball flying through space and that there are other terraforma planets out there would believe that they would believe in sort of the ancient aliens kinds of theories from uh, another, you know, distant uh, planet. More and more people are understanding that this idea of interstellar travels not likely or very possible. And more and more people are going to this uh, interdimensional being thing. But uh, the long and short of it all they all seem to be talking about things that are, they're quite similar. A number of these things all have a vein, a vein that runs through them like, uh, like a fine vein of pure gold would run through um, a virtually valueless rock. Somewhere within this monolith of various theories. Anunnaki, Archons, Titans and Gods, Sons of God, Demons, Fallen Angels. Somewhere within all of that runs a vein of pure truth. What exactly the vein is, I'm, I'm not entirely aware of, but we as those who believe the Bible, I think we have a, we have a really good uh, step up on it and a good foundation for at least crafting 
based on what the Bible can tell us, crafting a pretty solid circumstantial worldview concerning these things. And since it's been so long since I've really given these kinds of things some real deep, intense thought, consider some things. One thing that I've said in the past is that if, if the book of Genesis, and specifically the first 11 chapters, are not an account of factual, actual history, then it leaves this information open to so many interpretational variants that one would, <coughs> would say after listening to just a few of them, where does it stop? Where does it end? And the people who account the first 11 chapters of Genesis as metaphor, um, as um, mm, well, some as, as myth, or some believe that some of it's hyperbolic. <clears throat> some of some people don't believe that the first six days are, are actual days. And they put them into thousands of years, millions of years. Um, and you can get lost in all of that. I believe that Genesis 1 through 11, as well as the rest of the book of Genesis, is history. It's factual history. And what we read in it, we can take as factual history. One of the problems that Christians have had for very long time now, at least since the Reformation, from times when we have more solid records than before the Reformation, because that's when the big black hole is concerning history becomes very difficult to track. But at least since then, a lot of professed Christians who have written commentaries on the Bible have this problem. In Genesis chapter 3, what they want to do and what they're still doing to this day and what I was taught when I was a little kid is that Satan, this great, beautiful angel, head of Yahweh's choir, that this great, wonderful, gorgeous being entered into a snake, a serpent, and through the serpent, <clears throat> he caused Eve to sin. Well, that's all. That's all kind of nice. I I understand how it it solves some problems that the people reading this and then commenting on it have. But the fact is, that doesn't reflect what the text says. Not only does the text say that the serpent, Nachash, was more subtle, more crafty than any beast of the field Yahweh had made, so he's being given distinction. Satan is not only called Nachash in Genesis 3, but this is repeated throughout Scripture in various places, not to mention in Revelation, where he's called the dragon, that old serpent called Satan and the devil. That old serpent. And lest you think 
that since you're finding that affirmation in Revelation, and Revelation being a book of symbols and euphemisms and metaphors, an apocryphal book, he's called the serpent elsewhere. He's called the dragon compared to Leviathan elsewhere. So instead of us trying to soothe our minds and things that we can't understand by saying that Satan, a great angel of light, which there's no proof for, you, you get that because you reinterpret Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. That's how you come to that conclusion. Because there's, there's no markers in those books that should tell you that you're departing from talking about the king of Tyre, the king of Babylon, or the prince of Tyre, and the king of Babylon, that you're departing from speaking against them, and then all of a sudden you're speaking of Satan. Just because there's language and hyperbole in those passages that you may not understand, that does not mean that they're speaking of Satan. And we've got this, we've got now a twisted idea of who Satan is, and his name isn't Lucifer. Again, his name is... Lu Do you know what Lucifer is? The Morning Star? Do you know that Yeshua is called the Morning Star too, right? In the New Testament. So those passages, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, is referring to Satan, they gotta go. Okay? We, we, gotta, we gotta get them out of our vocabulary when trying to understand these things. Okay, I had to stop that for a second and just check because I don't want to make claims and not be able to back them up with Bible verses when I said that it is more than just Revelation and Genesis 3 where Satan is directly called a serpent. We can also check with Isaiah 27, 1 in that day, Yahweh with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, Leviathan, a sea serpent the fleeing serpent, and Leviathan, the twisted serpent. Also in passages in Isaiah, we see that those who are called evil and those who are called wicked, uh, they are called, it is said that their root is a serpent. In the Gospels, when Yeshua is talking to, or when John the Baptist is talking to the Pharisees, like Yeshua in John 8, 44 says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. They are also called by both Yeshua and John, they are called seeds of vipers, serpents. They are called the children of serpents. So there, there is a huge uh, um, amount of information uh, that we can get from Scripture itself continually calling Satan and the devil the serpent. Now a serpent isn't just a snake and does not have to be just a snake. A lot of people who believe this idea that Satan entered a serpent and that its judgment was it once had arms and legs and now it would not have arms and legs and so the snake, you know, it doesn't have arms and legs, but it used to. I, I literally heard that when I was a kid. That's not what's being said. That's not what's being said in the judgment of Yahweh on the serpent. He said to the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed above all livestock and above every animal of the field. Now pay attention, this is so important. He says, you're cursed above all livestock and every animal of the field. You shall go on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I'll put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He'll bruise your head. And you'll bruise his heel. Now, we know in this prophecy that the language being used is prophetic and metaphoric language. We know that. 
Anybody, anybody who will tell you that the prophecy in Genesis 3 concerning the Messiah is found here, they know it's metaphoric. So, why don't they believe that starting in 314, when Yahweh pronounces judgment on the serpent and says, you're cursed above all livestock, you shall go on your belly? That's, that, that's not metaphor too? All livestock and animal of the, animals of the field were put under the dominion of man. Up until this point, it's very possible that Nakash, who is identified as Satan and the devil, was not put under the dominion of man. But because he did this thing, he was to be cursed more than every animal of the field and all the livestock. And you know what? We could probably spend a great amount of time unpacking that and, and looking at, at how that has played out and manifested itself. But just keep that in mind. Genesis is history. Satan is Nakash. Nakash, he's called the serpent. Now, we can go into Exodus 7, 10 through 12. Um, well, this is, the, the, this is Aaron's staffs and the magicians of Pharaoh. They threw down their staff. They both turned into serpents. And Aaron's staff, that was a serpent, ate the serpents that the magicians of Pharaoh had thrown down because Yahweh is greater than their, their gods, who remember Yahweh said he was punishing their gods. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that's not where I meant to go to, but I meant to go to Numbers 21 and 6. Yahweh sent, now this says, venomous snakes among the people, and they bit the people. Many people of Israel died. We don't know for sure if the word here would translate correctly as venomous snakes, but it is Nakash Seraph. Let me pop on Numbers 21.6. Fiery Seraph, serpents, Nakash. You can do a word search on both the fiery and the serpent, both of them will come up with these serpentine. It, it, it's kind of amazing if you want to do word studies on both Nakash and Saraf. Nakash, serpent. <sighs> so there's a lot of serpents. And what does serpent mean? And we can't be so narrow-minded as to believe that it always means snake. Serpent, dragon, dragon-like creature, a reptilian creature of some kind. They would have they would have called upright walking um, dragons, like what we now call dinosaurs. Those would have been serpents. This stuff should, I think, give us all food for thought. When you consider that many of the legends, myths, and tales of different sorts of beings that in some way or another have interacted with man for a very long time, that different cultures, pagan cultures, worshipped, venerated, um... The symbolism and symbology of about every pagan culture concerning snakes and their veneration of snakes. Remember me reading on Amarika and Quetzalcoatl. It's universal. 
It's just absolutely universal. Then we've got this guy coming along talking about these serpents that they operate right outside of the spectrum of visible light. Now, I don't do that accent to, to be, you know, like nasty, Adam. I, I, I think British accents are awesome. So that's every chance I get, I try to fake one. I don't do it really great, though. Just so you know, it's not because I'm mocking him necessarily, but. And he's not alone in believing that. They operate outside of the spectrum of visible light. That's really interesting. Just, the, just think about that for a minute. If you have to pause this and just think about that for a minute. Think about how he and many others consider them reptiles or reptilians. Consider what we just read in Genesis 3 about Nakash, who is Satan and the devil. Consider how the pagan nations of the world universally, before they were evangelized with the, the great message of the kingdom and Yeshua, uh, crucified and resurrected universally worshipped and had in their symbology serpents serpents and the sun and the funny thing about Quetzalcoatl Quetzalcoatl the plumed serpent was the messenger of the sun the serpent and the sun Baal the sun the serpent and consider these things and consider this idea that somebody who does not have a redeemed mind in any way has about these beings operating, so he says, outside the spectrum of visible light. I do a poor English accent. But if I worked on it a little bit, I'd be okay. While you're considering that, I'm going to jump over here. First Kings 8. Now, this is talking about when Solomon had built Yahweh's temple, and he built the first temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem. Okay? Um... And it says, because they were, they were putting the uh, ornaments and, and things of the tabernacle into the temple. So I'll start at 1 Kings 8-9. It says, There was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets which Moses put there at Horeb when Yahweh made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. It came to pass, when the priests had come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled Yahweh's house so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For Yahweh's glory filled Yahweh's house. Then Solomon said, Yahweh has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Say, what? Yahweh said he would dwell in the thick darkness? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what Solomon says. Right here. And we're going to TSK cross-reference that. Go to Deuteronomy 4.11. You came near and stood under the mountain. The mountain burned with fire to the heart of the sky, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. We have a repeat of what Solomon says in 2 Chronicles 6 1. Solomon said, Yahweh has said that he would dwell in the thick 
darkness. A cloud of thick darkness. And it's called right here for in First Kings 8, 11, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, semicolon, for Yahweh's glory filled Yahweh's house. And there was a thick black cloud. Um, let's continue on here. We can go to uh, Psalm 18, 8 through 11. Smoke went out of his nostrils, consuming fire came out of his mouth, coals were kindled by it. He bowed, bowed the heavens also and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cher cherub. He rode on a cherub and flew. Yes, he soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his pavilion around him darkness of waters, thick clouds in the sky. That's Psalm 18, 8 through 11. Now Psalm 97, 2 says, clouds and darkness are around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Let me see if I've got Yep, I've got that one. Yahweh spoke these words to all your assembly on the mountain, out of the middle of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness. With a great voice, he added no more. He wrote them on two stone tablets, gave them to me. So, we see this again and again. You go, go back to Job. Yahweh describing the earth. He says he has wrapped it in thick darkness. You notice when they, they send those amateur rockets up or those balloons up, and as soon as it gets to a certain height and it starts looking around, what's around? What What is it? What does it show? Does it show the stars and the galaxies that are supposed to be ever-present out there in this made-up universe of theirs? Or does it show what Yahweh said? Thick darkness like sackcloth, water, and thick darkness. He's made thick darkness his pavilion. Now you think about this and you say, but I don't understand. Wait, you know, what? Uh, he's supposed to be light. Well, yes, we see, like in the last chapter of Revelation, that uh, the city, it needed no light because he was the light and the lamb was the light. We see in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the Word was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Perhaps this thick darkness has to do with, let me see which quote it is. Yes. Leviticus 16.2 And Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at all times into the most holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud on the mercy seat. He says he'll appear from that cloud on the mercy seat. That cloud being described in 1 Kings 8.11 as his glory. Why? Why? As they describe a thick black cloud. Well, you remember 
when Moses was on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, with Yahweh, Yahweh would not allow Moses to see him. In fact, he placed Moses in a cleft of a rock and held his hand over that so that all that Moses could see was his receding glory. That's all he would allow. And even that was a great deal for Moses when Moses came back down from the mountain. Some translations say his face shone and it was so terrible for the people to look at that they made him cover it and put a veil over it. But others that are digging more into the ancient Hebrew says that he had horns protruding from his head. Now, what that means, I don't know. I don't know. But Moses spending that time with Yahweh and being able to view only his receding glory did something did something amazing, amazing, to quite literally just the appearance in the face of Moses. You have to wonder if that thick blackness, that black, dark cloud, is the way in which this holy God, who is Yahweh, shields his unbelievable, amazing appearance that we can't begin to grasp from unworthy, sinful flesh. Virtually any time somebody has a, a vision of him and they're quite frequently a bit different uh, and they see different aspects, different things, but it's a commonplace thing for people to be so awestruck and sometimes terrified. And you have to even wonder what exactly the vision they're seeing is and how they're allowed to see these certain things. You know, you recall all the children of Israel back in Exodus 20 after Yahweh had finished speaking. The commandments, the children of Israel said to Moses, Speak with us yourself, and we will listen. But don't let God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid, for God has come to test you, and, and that his fear may be before you, that you won't sin. The people stayed at a distance. And Moses came near to the thick darkness where Elohim was thick darkness. These are things to consider. It's things to consider. Yahweh doesn't need light to see. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was life. The life was the light of men. Yahweh doesn't need light to see. He's spirit. Now, what are angels? As per the book of Hebrews, are they not ministering spirits for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Spirits. Spirits. This is what we're told is the spectrum of waves and energy. This is what they've at least been willing to tell us. And who knows about what they, the, the, the they, the abstract they, 
don't know. It's a lot. It's it's a lot. But I think it's safe to say, and I could point you in the direction of and remember these passages, First Kings twenty two, nineteen through twenty four. And also check Second Kings six. Just do yourself a quick search on Balaam and Balaam's donkey. It's probably going to be in numbers. I don't got the exact passage here. Go look at Jacob wrestling with the angel at the brook when he was traveling back into uh, Canaan. The fiery chariots that, that came and picked up Elijah. This is just this creation that we live in, the, the eyes that we see with. They're very limited. And we are flesh. Yahweh's spirit. I would say that those who are referred to as sons of God, at least some of them are spirit. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if all of them are or not. It's hard to say. I haven't put a lot of time into studying these things out because for one thing, I notice that people tend to get very obsessive with these things. Professed Christians get obsessive with these things. I don't think we should ever get obsessive about these, these things. I'm not saying it's not good to be informed, and especially everything the Bible will tell us about these things. Then that's good to be informed of, you know. But, I, I tend to focus on other things, I suppose, when I study. Or in a lot of ways, I don't actually focus at all, specifically when I'm doing my my daily readings and general studies. So, but when I do my my actual studies, I have been focusing on other things because there's issues that that I think have a lot more weight, uh, at least for me, uh, right now. But I do think this is a good thing that we begin to understand and begin to understand what we can understand um, from what the Bible tells us because that's where we should be getting all of our truth so with these things in mind I, I know that I'm actually I'm going to be thinking about these things a lot because there were, were a number of verses uh, that I looked at as cross-references. And, uh, and not too long ago, I did do a pretty extensive uh, word study on both Nakash and Seraph. And you can find both of those words back-to-back -back in those two passages from Numbers um, that I gave you. And you probably be able to find that in 7, 10 through 12 also. Um, and you'll find it in Isaiah 6, 4. Sorry, it's Isaiah 6, 4, Numbers 21, 6, and 21, 8. And it'll give you something to think about. So, I'm going to wrap it up. And I was glad to be able to be here with you. I hope that I see some of you in the chat uh, tomorrow on Sabbath at 10 Eastern Standard Time. So until then, remember, Yeshua is Lord, God's kingdom, Yahweh's kingdom is forever, and I'm your servant. So farewell.